respectful of your time, so we'll go ahead and uh, get moving on here. So, welcome back. Hopefully, I didn't scare anyone off too bad last time, and hopefully, y'all had a nice Fourth of July. Hopefully, it was nice and socially distant and safe and all of that. Um, again, if you want to ask questions, I really stress doing so, even if it sounds like I'm blown by a topic and you had one, I'll certainly go back. So feel free to go ahead and put those either in the chat or if you recall, if you go to the Canvas site, you know, going to that sticky board, that's another good way to do that um, during class in a more anonymous fashion. So feel free to do that. I will try to get to both um, as class goes on. Um, so without further ado, let's go ahead and get into uh, unit two, which is about our secondary messengers and then dose response. So we talked about um, different types of receptors last time and we talked about our definitions. And so now we can say, okay, well, once a drug or some sort of ligand binds to a receptor, what happens after that, right? Um, so those are the secondary messengers we'll get into and then we'll talk about dose responses after that. So kind of um, getting a little more into the pharmacodynamics of things. So getting into our second messengers, Basically, um, this is any sort of like molecule that's relaying signals. So, you know, we talked about our cell surface receptors, uh, whether those were like the ion gated channels, whether those were um, G protein coupled receptors, there's usually some secondary effect that happens downstream of that. And so um, we'll talk about some of the more common ones that are found with a lot of drugs. And I'll give you some actual real life examples, um, some of which um, you may have heard of, some of which may be new to you. Either way, it's totally fine. But don't worry about specific examples because um, I'm not going to be quizzing on that specific. I'm not going to ask you like specific drug questions this early on. Uh, that'll be when we get into farm one and farm two for sure, right? So anyway, so um, the most common ones we'll talk about include cyclic AMP. Some of these you probably heard of before, either in like a biochem class or in, in chemistry, uh, or more like biology. But yeah, cyclic AMP, cyclic GMP. We'll talk about calcium and phosphonosatide, which are going to be important ones for certain reactions. Um, and again, how they are activated can be through many mechanisms. So either be uh, via enzymes, could be opening of ion channels, could be changes in um, you know, electric potential of the membrane, could be lots of different things. But we'll see what happens sort of after the fact. Cyclic AMP will be the first one we'll talk about here. This is basically where uh, the enzyme adenylocyclase will convert ATP, which we remember as being sort of the high energy currency of the cell uh, and turning that into cyclic AMP. Uh, and then from there, it can target target things like protein kinases and can phosphorylate things and all of that. And so just to give you some examples of different things that work through cyclic AMP, that can include things like ACTH, glucagon, see a lot of hormones that can actually end up working uh, via cyclic AMP. So like TSH, vasopressin, all of that. So getting into um, some of the, the actions you're going to see here as a result of, say, like, for instance, a hormone comes and activates a G protein here. So you have the drug or the hormone, whatever, coming to bind to this G protein uh, right here on the cell surface. That then is going to catalyze the G protein then to go along and activate adenylocyclase, right? So once this occurs, this then causes that conversion of ATP over to cyclic AMP, and then something happens afterwards, right? I'll give you some examples of different things that can happen, but it could be myriad different things depending on what sort of tissue you're dealing with, what side of, sort of um, uh, cells you're dealing with. It can be many different things. So just know that this is what happens. The G protein is activated. You're then going to have your adenyl cyclase activated, and that's what forms the cyclic AMP, right? So. Um, and again, like I mentioned, you can see lots of different things happening here. I'll give you some specific examples of how this works. So for instance, we can have things like um, glycogenolysis and gluconeogenesis that can occur in the liver as a result of the actions of glucagon. Glucagon here being the hormone that uh, is released when, you're, um, when your blood sugar is low, you need to activate and mobilize glucose from the liver. That's cyclic AMP. That can be one way that that occurs. Um, and I'll get into some more specific examples like vasopressin. I'll show you what that looks like in a moment here. Even things like um, calcium homeostasis in the parathyroid uh, glands. We can look at things like uh, the heart and how the actions of catecholamines like epinephrine and norepi can affect things like heart rate and the force of contraction, right? The actual contractility of the heart itself. So just to give you an example here of what it would look like in the case of say a hepatocyte, right? So we have a liver cell here and let's say we're in a fight or flight response. I'm not sure if you've 
talked about the sympathetic nervous system with um, with Professor Kaplan yet. But let's say we release epinephrine, let's say like a, a bear jumps out at us or someone scares us, we're in that fight or flight response. Epinephrine is going to come down and it'll end up binding to these G proteins. Oh good, I'm glad you talked about that already. Um, so you'll activate this G protein here that will then cause adenylocyclase to form cyclic AMP, right? This is the secondary messenger. And you can see here that it's causing a huge number of different responses to happen here, right? Um, now, don't get bogged down in all the details of this, but the main thing I want to sort of focus on is sort of the end product. Like we, that's what we really care about is what happens as a result of this epinephrine bind to this receptor. What's the end result? Well, it's the formation of glucose, right? So for instance, breaking down glycogen and turning it into glucose and then boom now we have glucose being released out into the bloodstream and now we have energy to run away from that uh, that threat or whatever the case may be right so but that is a direct result of the hormone or the drug or whatever the ligand is binding to that protein here activating cyclic AMP and now we have more glucose available right another good example would be the actions of ADH in the kidneys this is another really important thing we'll probably spend a lot of time on in farm one when we're talking about cardiology and whatnot because really the kidneys play such a big role in terms of um, hypertension and, and all that so um, we can imagine things like um, vasopressin or antidiuretic hormone which antidiuretic means anti-urination so you're holding on to a lot of water um, you'll see that things like vasopressin is really important for um, holding on to water by placing these aquaporin channels into the uh, luminal side of the collecting duct of the nephron right we'll talk much more about this later so don't again don't get bogged down too much in the details but you can see here here's a vasopressin receptor that then goes and eventually activates dental cyclase you get cyclic amp and then now you have more aquaporin channels being placed in this luminal side of the collecting duct which means you hold on to more water which means your blood volume goes up which means you're going to have uh, your blood pressure go up um, you know uh, all those normal things you would think about happening with antidiuretic hormone. These are the actions, right? And as a, as a result of the activation of these secondary messenger systems. Here is a good example of um, the sympathetic nervous system specifically working on a myocyte, right? So we have a cardiomyocyte here, here we have the synaptic junction, and here we have our sympathetic nerve terminal, right? So this is a, a nerve that is being projected down onto the heart and what does it release? Well, again, similar in that fight or flight response, it's going to release norepinephrine onto the heart. And here we end up having our beta adrenergic receptors. And if you recall, your beta 1 adrenergic receptors on the heart cause increases in uh, heart rate and increases in contract contractility, all of that. Well, it's through this same secondary messenger system here, right? Adenyl cyclase causes that conversion to cyclic AMP, and then we have protein kinases being activated. And now in the myocyte, what happens here is it actually allows for more calcium to flow into these ion channels, right? And if you know anything about muscle physiology, you know that more calcium means stronger attraction between actin and myosin, you get stronger contractions, right? And again, basic, same, basically the same process is just dependent on what type of tissue you're in in terms of what sort of effects you're gonna get here, right? So in the kidneys, cyclic AMP causes you to hold on to more water. In these uh, cardiac cells, you get more contractility. So all of it's very dependent on the tissue you're dealing with. So uh, sort of similar, so kind of like a cousin to cyclic AMP can be cyclic GMP. So just like adenylocyclase causes cyclic AMP to be formed, you can find guanylocyclase causes CGMP to be formed here, right? And so we can find that in different tissues, you're going to find different actions for this. Um, we tend to find that cyclic GMP is really important for regulating things like ion channel activation and whatnot. Um, so for instance, like in the intestinal tract, uh, we can find this in the vascular smooth muscle. A lot of smooth muscle tends to be affected by cyclic GMP and can affect things like vasodilation and changing blood flow, depending on kind of where, you know, what, kind of what state you're in, what tissue you're dealing with, all of that. So imagine this is a smooth muscle cell that is surrounding um, a blood vessel, right? So this is a vascular smooth muscle. And let's say we have an agonist come along and activate this guanylocyclase here, right? So we have GTP, gets converted over to cyclic GMP, and then that can allow for things like these calcium channels to be modulated, right? Either open them or close them. In this case here, cyclic GMP, uh, cyclic GMP actually helps to decrease intracellular calcium levels. So as opposed to like what we saw with cyclic AMP in the heart where it actually opened up calcium channels, this is actually trying to close them. Ultimately, you're going to find there's less contraction because less calcium means less 
actinomycin binding together, and then you have less contraction. So this actually causes this muscle cell to relax, right? Um, why is that important? Well, because um, if we need to increase blood flow to certain areas of the body, say for instance, like the heart, then you would want this smooth muscle to be relaxed to increase the diameter of the blood vessel, thus more flow happens, right? And so what's interesting with these systems too is that you can find that um, you know we can affect things not only by it trying to increase the production of things like CNGMP, but we can also do things like trying to prevent the breakdown of it, right? So for instance here, and you don't want to have you know rampant uh, production of cyclic GMP because you want to have regulation on that. You want to have control over that. And so there's enzymes that can work to basically break cyclic GMP down to decrease its activity. So things like phosphodiesterase 5, this PDE5, is really important to help regulate this. So you know, guanyl cyclase forms cyclic GMP, but then PDE5 breaks it down, right? Because again, you don't want to have just systems kind of going um, ad infinitum. You want to have some sort of control over this. But what's cool is we can kind of alter the system either way with drugs, right? So here's a good example of this. Um, we'll talk about nitroglycerin and how it's really important for using it in cases of like angina and myocardial ischemia. This is actually going to be a drug that stimulates cyclic GMP, the production of cyclic GMP. But um, I don't know if anyone's ever heard of the drug sildenafil before, um, but this is the generic name for the drug Viagra, right? And so I'm sure most people have heard of Viagra and what it's used for, um, but basically it treats erectile dysfunction, right? So what you can see here is it's kind of neat because uh, instead of trying to directly produce more cyclic GMP, you can actually use sildenafil to inhibit the breakdown of it and thus you get the same effect. You get more cyclic GMP in the system because of less of it's being broken down and thus that will also cause the same effect to cause vascular smooth muscle relaxation. Thus you get more blood flow and thus you can achieve an erection more easily, right? Um, we do this a lot in children with things like pulmonary hypertension where all those blood vessels in the lungs, if they're all constricted, that can really impede blood flow. But we use sildenafil in little kids too, especially with cardiac conditions to help open up those vessels and allow for better flow through, right? So that way they can oxygenate better and supply the tissues with more oxygen. So it can kind of go either way, depending on the drugs and depending on the, the enzyme systems we're interacting with. So getting back to that nitroglycerin example, imagine here we have a drug called nitrostat, which is just uh, sublingual nitroglycerin. We'll talk about, or we talked about drug routes already, so this is a sublingual uh, route. Basically, what you'll find is nitroglycerin, or NTG, gets converted over into nitric oxide. Now notice this is not nitrous oxide, that's laughing gas. This is no laughing matter when you're having a heart attack, okay? Um, but anyway, so nitric oxide then gets activated, or will then activate guanyl cyclase, right? So nitric oxide, you get guanyl cyclase formed. Now we know that, okay, well, I know once guanyl cyclase is activated, then you get cyclic GMP, right? Well, cyclic GMP is important because this actually allows for the coronary uh, vessels to open up, right? You activate those protein kinases in the smooth muscle cells, and thus you get relaxation, right? Relaxation, you get better blood flow, you get more oxygen being delivered, and now your angina is fixed, right? Hopefully. Otherwise, you're going to find that then you'll have to call 911 and, and go to the ER for that MI you're having. But what's interesting, too, is that if anyone's ever uh, aware when dealing with uh, people on nitroglycerin, and again, if you think about like you know, an older gentleman who might have erectile dysfunction, you actually can't give nitroglycerin with things like sildenafil or Viagra. Because if you think about it, it makes really good sense, because if I have something that increases production of cyclic GMP, and they're also taking a drug that is decreasing the breakdown of it, it's way too much. And so what happens is they'll get so much cyclic GMP there that their blood vessels will dilate like crazy. And then they basically have hypotension, they bottom out, and then they, they syncopize basically, right? So you can see that this is really important when you're considering these different enzyme systems and how they're interplaying with one another. Now, again, don't get so bogged down in this specific example. We'll talk more about that much later when we get into the actual um, drug classes next semester. So calcium is also another really big one. I'll focus mostly on calcium, but also there's another regulatory um, secondary messenger called inositol triphosphate or IP3 that also has a play here as well. And calcium is a really important um, secondary messenger because you can find that one, it helps with things like muscle contraction, like we've already talked about, but also it can help to influence things like secretion of certain substances like insulin being released from vesicles and the uh, beta cells of the pancreas can be affected by this. You can also find things like cell division can be affected by this. So that you can see that can uh, maybe play a role with things like cancer potentially where you're having cells dividing sort of um, uh, unchecked. Uh, so 
we also know too that not only do we have calcium that can come in from outside of the cell just via passive diffusion recall too um, that calcium is stored frequently in cells in places like the sarcoplasmic and the endoplasmic reticulum and so regulation of that storage of calcium can also be quite important as well so here's an example of a signal molecule coming and activating a g protein coupled receptor which we've already talked about and then notice here the g proteins will then go and activate um, basically cleavage of this product here so we have this ip3 and there's another one called diacylglycerol. I wouldn't worry too much about that, but both of these are playing a role in regulating that calcium. So you can see here how the IP3 actually goes directly down to that endoplasmic reticulum and allows that calcium to flow out. And then whatever happens downstream, whether it be uh, smooth muscle contraction, whether it be um, causing uh, you know vesicles of hormones to be released from the cell, whatever the case may be, that calcium is gonna be really important um, to be activated there with this IP3 molecule. So. And basically, you're going to find that every cell can have multiple signaling pathways. And so ultimately, it gets fairly complicated. But if you know the major ones, um, the major pathways that can affect a certain type of tissue, you can know what type of drugs can be affecting that. So for instance, when you're looking at a vascular or smooth muscle cell, um, it's not just so simple as looking at like nitric oxide and looking at, um, you know, phosphodesterase. There's different things that can have um, both synergistic effects and antagonistic effects too, right? Because you want to make sure that you're having regulation of this smooth muscle so that way you're shuttling blood to the right area. So for instance, if I have a big meal and I'm in my rest and digest phase, I probably want to have things like acetylcholine activating muscarinic receptors so that way I get relaxation of smooth muscle going to like the gut, for instance. On the other hand, if I'm, say, in a fight or flight response, I probably don't really care about digesting that food so much as I do about getting blood to the heart, the head, and to the muscles. And so you can find that different pathways can have different effects here. So just to show you uh, some different examples here, we can see how things like epinephrine can work on beta-2 receptors to cause relaxation. So I'm wondering how acetylcholine can do this. Um, we'll see things like angiotensin II, which is like really, really important when we're talking about blood pressure, um, can cause contraction by affecting the IP3 and releasing calcium, right? Um, so ultimately it gets fairly complicated, but don't worry, we'll get through this together. Um, just know that you can have a lot of different systems at play here, some of which are, can be synergistic, some of which can be antagonistic, depending on kind of what we're doing, right? Okay, so next I want to get into talking about dose response relationships. So what, what does that really mean? So imagine you're running a pharmacodynamic study, so you're trying out a new drug. Um, basically what we want to find out is that at different dosages, we should find that the drug causes different effects, right? So if I give more of a drug, I should expect to see more effect, right? Seem, seems like it makes sense. And so you can do that in several different ways. I could actually do it like in a group of subjects. I can give it to actual people and see what their response is. Or I could even do that if they were in very early stage testing on organs or tissues or cells, animals perhaps even, you could do that. Um, and again, when we're talking about this relationship, it's a dose response relationship. So we're trying to find that basically at, at a specific concentration of drug at the receptor site, and then what kind of response we're gonna get from that, okay? So um, looking at this, let's imagine we were trying to look at an antihypertensive, right? So the example we're looking at is lowering blood pressure. So we're going to see that if I were to give more of a drug, I should get a lower blood pressure, right? I should get, you know, uh, more relaxation of that vascular smooth muscle. Blood pressure should go down in those cases, right? Or whatever the mechanism happens to be for that drug. And so we can actually look at that sort of mathematical relationship and plot that on a graph and you have some idea of the type of effects we're going to see. So we're going to look at a lot of graphs today and see how those can kind of help us sort of interpret how drugs are working, um, uh, things like potency and all of that are going to come into play here. So um, when we're testing a drug, typically they like to show sort of three things at a baseline. One, if the drug isn't there, then you don't get any effect. So if I were to give someone uh, no drug, I shouldn't see any change in blood pressure. Now, does that always hold true? Not necessarily. I'm sure many of you have heard of the placebo effect, where if people think they're getting active drug, the body can actually see actual changes there. So that's one thing why we like to do a lot of placebo-controlled trials to make sure that we account for that placebo effect, right? Um, we want to see that by adding more drug, we should get incremental changes in that effect. So the more drug I give, the lower that blood pressure should become. And then finally, when you take the drug away, the patient should go back to that sort of pre-medication level, right? 
So I should expect, you know, and again, we're talking about a short course of time here. I'm giving more drug. I allow the drug to get out of the system. Their blood pressure should go back to, to normal, right? This is a really frustrating thing you'll find with a lot of patients to where they'll um, start like an antihypertensive regimen and they'll get their blood pressure under control and they think, all right, I don't have hypertension anymore. And they stop taking their meds and they don't realize this fact here that they go right back to the baseline level uh, if they stop taking their stuff. But uh, and essentially how we plot this, you can expect to see this sort of S shape uh, curve that will pop up here, where if you're looking at the dose on the X axis and then the response on the Y axis, you'd expect that if there's no dose, there's no drug around that you're not really getting any effect. And then you'll find a point here where you start to get this sort of steep curve and then eventually you get this plateau up here at the top. Now we'll talk about this plateau a little bit later, but this is essentially when every receptor available is occupied. Right, because again, there's a point where I can keep adding more drug, but if there's no receptors for it to activate with because they're all bound up by the drug, then nothing additional is gonna happen, right? So uh, as I mentioned, the x-axis is always gonna be plotting that concentration of the drug. Usually we look at the log concentration just for ease of comparison between different drugs. We'll see that in a moment. Um, and then on the y-axis here, that's where we get our effect. And really that can be anything we want, right? So we can do things like enzyme activity. We can look at membrane potential, hormone secretion, heart rate, blood pressure, anything you want, right? Can be on the effect side here on the y-axis. And so um, some definitions we're gonna use when we're talking about this includes the ED50, or the median effective dose. And so this is essentially the dose at which 50% of the population or the sample that I'm using, if it was like a tissue sample or something, manifests the given effect, okay? And so you can see here, looking at percentage of individuals responding, when that point where you get 50% of people responding, that's the ED50. Now, we don't dose at the ED50 because I wouldn't wanna give a drug to a patient saying, hey, it's 50-50 shot, this is gonna work. Typically, patients like to have a little bit better chance than that. Um, but this is useful as a comparison point. When we're looking at different drugs together, um, this is helpful for us to make um, some fair comparisons. We'll look at that in just a little bit. So um, looking at the curve, normally we're going to be using these semi-logarithmic semi curves because that actually helps us to get those S-shaped patterns like I was mentioning there and helps us to um, plot drugs against one another. So I, that way we can do some comparisons, especially over um, large differences in doses. Because again, I mentioned before, some drugs are dosed in grams, some in milligrams, some in micrograms. And so you want to have a scale that can sort of help out with that. Um, and so as I mentioned, we can uh, plot this with the log of the concentration. It's easier to estimate that ED50 here. So you can look at uh, the case here where we have three different drugs and three different ED50s essentially, um, different concentrations where they get that effect. And so we'll talk about the differences like in the heights of the curves and things like that to make some uh, good comparisons here. Now, if you were to just look at things like the receptor occupancy here, again, notice how as the concentration goes up, I'm gonna get more and more of those receptors activated and notice here that plateau effect's gonna happen where you don't get any additional effect because all the receptors are being bound up, right? So there's sort of four standard parameters we can find for these drugs here. So there's the baseline response, which should be the bottom of the curve, which should be zero, hopefully. There's the maximal response you're gonna get or basically when they get full uh, receptor occupancy. There's that slope of the curve, which is uh, something a lot of people don't think about. And depending on how shallow or how steep the slope is, basically will tell you what sort of changes in effect you're expecting to get with uh, changes in dose. So the more steep this is, um, causing even small changes in dose may see really big effects on the patient, right? Um, versus other drugs, which I may increase the dose pretty significantly and not see much effect. A lot of that has to go with that actual, um, the, the steepness of that curve itself, the slope there. And then ED50, as I mentioned, is when we're getting the half maximal effective concentration, should be halfway between the baseline and the maximum there. And this is gonna help us determine that potency. And if you recall, potency is essentially um, telling us sort of um, how much drug it takes to get a given effect. And then we can compare potency to other, other people as well, or other drugs. And so there's two ways we can look at this effect here. We can look at it as sort of like a graded response, sort of like if we were looking at individual blood pressure for a person, right? So if I was to look at one individual person, give them different doses of a drug, and then actually plot that out, that would be this graded response. And then there's also what we call a quantal response, which I'll talk about a second. And this is where we're kind of getting like an all or none sort of phenomenon. So we'll talk about that in just a little bit. Uh, but that's going to be good for things like, um, say I was doing like anesthesia drugs. I said, okay, 50% of the people were asleep or awake. So kind of an all or none sort of thing there.
So when I'm looking at the graded dose response relationship, that's helpful because I can actually look at sort of that relationship between drug receptor occupancy um, versus plotted against that dose there, right? And so this is sort of the simplest way of doing this. This is um, something you would do kind of in the preclinical sort of testing in a lot of cases, especially if you're just working on, on a particular tissue sample or something like that. Um, but again, remember that when all the receptors are bound, that's when you should see the maximal effect. And we recall last time we talked about things like full agonists and partial agonists and all of that. So that'll make some sense when you're looking at these graphs here in a little bit. Um, we should expect to see that the response is going to be continuous and gradual, right? You shouldn't see like big changes in that as concentrations change because it's just looking at how many of those receptors are occupied and as that goes up you should see that increase in a continuous response right and again we'll look at that and compare it to all or none responses in just a little bit okay and so when you're looking at this you basically call it a graded dose response curve i'll show you what these look like in just a second <clears throat> But again, illustrating that relationship and looking at that resulting physiologic effect, like how big of a magnitude and an effect we're going to get here. And these are going to be really helpful to compare different drugs together in terms of looking at their relative efficacies to one another and also their potencies for one another, as we'll see in just a moment here. Um, and again, using that ED50 is going to be really helpful as a comparison point between these different drugs. So again, um, looking at um, comparing these different drugs together, we can see here that one, the ED50 is going to be helping us with potency, right? So again, this is when you have roughly 50% of receptors being occupied, you should get the ED50 essentially, right? And so basically how far to the left or right this uh, curve is, the ED50 is, gives us an idea of how potent the drug is, which makes sense because if it's further to the left, and needing, I'm needing much less drug to get that ED50, it means it's more potent versus if it was way further to the right, it would be less potent because I need more drug to get to the ED50. That's one thing we're going to look at. Now, as clinicians, you're not really caring about the potency so much because you're like, well, I don't care. I just want to know what the dose of the drug is. But what you probably do care about is how efficacious your drug is going to be, right? And so this is this maximal effect here. So this is what you really care about clinically because I want a drug that is more efficacious, right? So I want something that's going to get the most bang for my buck for my patients here. And you figure out the dose, you pharmaceutical people. I don't really care. You just tell me what it is. But again, it's going to be helpful when we're comparing different drugs to one another. And so as I mentioned, potency is referring to usually milligrams, but it could be micrograms, could be grams, whatever, needed to produce a given effect, right? So I could be looking at changes in blood pressure. I could be looking at changes in pain scale. I could be looking at lots of different things. And then um, that drug's effect can be evaluated based on both the efficacy and the potency. We're going to look at both of those together. And luckily, those graded response curves kind of tell us that, right? So looking at the potency here we can see that we're measuring the amount of drug necessary to produce a given effect. So let's imagine we're comparing three different drugs together, A, B, and C. Um, remember, further to the left you go on the curve, the uh, more potent a drug is, right? Uh, the further you go on the right, looking at the ED50, the less potent it is, the more drug I'm going to need to get a given, uh, given effect, okay? Now, if you were to look at the efficacy of all three of these, you can see they all have the same E max. They all have the same uh, peak effect here, which is good to know because that means that, um, say for instance, I was comparing morphine to fentanyl. We talked about that example last time where morphine is less potent. I have to give maybe like five milligrams of IV morphine to get a given effect that maybe I'm only giving 50 to 100 micrograms of fentanyl. Fentanyl is going to be further over here to the left because it's more potent. Morphine might be over here to the right uh, somewhat because it's less potent, even more of the drug, but ultimately they can probably get the same efficacy, right? So it really doesn't matter which one I'm using, it just had to adjust my dose to account for that. So that's the one important thing you'll see uh, when you're looking at drug dosing. You're like, well, why am I giving micrograms of this one and milligrams of this one? It all has to do with that potency you're going to see there, okay? So, and again, um, you know, a lot of times that has already been taken into account when you're looking at drug references and things like that. So if you're looking at equipotent doses uh, between uh, different analgesics, for instance, that there's charts out there that'll tell you that. And so that's something that you can look up uh, for a given type of drug. So looking at potency here, again, imagine we have four different drugs, A, B, C, and D, with the log of the concentration here and then the response. So if you had to, you know, had a test question, you're saying, okay, which one of these drugs is the most potent? Well, you'd probably say the drug A is most potent because again, it's further the ED50 is the furthest to the left. And then I can then compare that to the ED50s of these other drugs to tell, okay, well, I know that the second most potent is going to be B. I know C is less potent than that. And then D is the least potent out of the bunch here. Okay. It just means that to achieve the ED50, 
for drug D, I would need the most of it, right? So as compared to like drug A, for instance. Now that's not talking about the relative efficacies of the drug. We'll talk about that in a moment. But in terms of just pure potency, drug A would have the highest and D the lowest here. So, uh, and again, clinically, you care more about efficacy, right? Because we've already taken care of looking at um, the doses we need to give. And that's, you'll find that too when you're looking at um, you know, your drug references and, and whatnot there. Um, but again, when we're looking at the efficacy here, remember agonists tend to have a positive effect. And I'm not saying positive in terms of like what's good for your patient. I'm just saying that's causing an effect to occur, right? Instead of blocking it like an antagonist would have. Um, and again, I'll go back to our example of opioids again because it's pretty pretty salient here. Um, what you're going to find is that a drug with greater efficacy may be more therapeutically beneficial than one that is more potent, right? So again, you don't really care about the potency so much, but you do care about the efficacy, okay? Because that's, again, how efficacious drugs are going to be. It's how well it's going to work for your patient there. So if you were to look at the relative efficacies of these four drugs here, you could say, okay, well, you know, A and C look like they're going to be equally efficacious because they have the same E max or the same uh, top part of the, the curve here versus B and D would also be equally efficacious to one another, but they are both less efficacious than drug A and C. Now, A and B are going to be equally potent, you have to give the same amount of drug to get their uh, to achieve their ED fifties, but ultimately drug A would be better than drug B in terms of just pure clinical effect. Does it mean drug A is the best drug? Well, it's not necessarily any better than drug C, but you know it just has to do with what kind of dose you're going to be giving. Maybe micrograms of drug A versus milligrams of drug C, for instance. So potency doesn't really tell you about how good of a drug it is, um, but certainly the efficacy can influence that for sure. So, um, and again, we're seeing that the efficacy is associated with a vertical axis, right? So how high on that curve can we achieve uh, in, t in terms of efficacy there? And so again, this is important because if I need to get my patient's blood pressure down 20 points and drug B is only gonna be able to get it down 10 points, then it's not a very good drug, right? Maybe I need to go with drug A that's gonna be more efficacious here. But let's say for instance, my patient only needs a 10 point drop in their blood pressure um, and drug B is way cheaper than drug A. Well, now that's gonna be another variable that's gonna be affecting that decision in terms of what drug is best for the patient. So ultimately what it comes down to is, well, it depends. There's a lot of factors that go into it than just purely looking at the efficacy and the potency of a drug here, right? And again, just that the top of the curve here is what we call the Emax. So that's a way to compare efficacies between various drugs. So, uh, and again, looking at this curve, uh, we talked about potency, A being the most potent, D the least potent based on the ED50s. Well, now look at the height of the curve, and this is gonna tell us which drugs are gonna be most effective. We can see drugs A and C are equally effective. Drug B would be a little less effective than that, and drug D would be the least effective out of the bunch. It still may be sufficient for your patient, but it may just not be the most efficacious out of the bunch here. And again, if it costs a 10th of what drug A and C does, and this is enough effect, for my particular patient, then it, it's a great drug, right? So um, and a lot of that is gonna um, uh, be very dependent on the patient, the situation, lots of things. So um, when we're looking at um, these curves too, we wanna to think about things like affinity and then intrinsic activity. And so we're gonna see that this has big effects on the ED50 in terms of how, um, how much affinity a drug has for a particular receptor. If you have a high affinity for the receptor, it likes to bind to that and it likes to stick around on that receptor there, right? So how tightly the drug binds to the receptor or how tightly once that key gets into that lock, that's the affinity there. And so, you know, we can see that the drug's action can be affected by not only the quantity of drug that's there, not only how much of it is reaching the receptor, but two, how much of it, how, how tightly is it being bound to that receptor, right? And so I'll show you an example of that in just a little bit. Um, but so things with high affinity, even at low concentrations may be pretty effective because once they're there at the receptor, they like to stick around there for a while. Okay, so Caitlin's asking, would it be better if the drug is more potent because you don't have to give as much, or is that less important? Um, you tend to find that the drug companies will have taken that into account. So um, say, for instance, um, imagine you had uh, a patient in pain. Well, back to using fentanyl and morphine because it's a pretty uh, common example there. Um, what's interesting is that even though fentanyl is much more potent than morphine is, roughly like 50 to 100 times more potent, um, you tend to find that actually the way they package a lot of those drug doses is that it's already taken into account. So for instance, I can get a vial of two milligrams of morphine and I can get a vial of 100 micrograms of fentanyl. Right? So that's roughly 
somewhat equally efficacious between there. Um, and so I can get the same effective dose for a patient out of one vial. It's not like I have to get, you know, uh, a vial with just 10 micrograms of morphine and get like a thousand of them together. Like you wouldn't do that. So clinically they take that into account and they've already kind of figured that out with like the packaging and the doses they recommend and things like that. So, um, you won't be thinking as a clinician much about potency, but just know that when you see drugs that are dosed in micrograms or milligrams or grams, that's what's going into that is how relatively potent the drugs are, right? So is it better on the body if you're giving less though or not really? Not really. Um, you tend to find that the body is um, able to handle the doses for the most part um, that have uh, been determined, right? Because when we are bringing a drug to market, we're not only thinking about how efficacious it is, we're also gonna talk about like the toxicities and the safety features of it too. So I could have a drug that's like excellent and I can only give maybe a nanogram of it to get the effect that I'm looking for, but then if it causes death in like 10% of patients, it's not a very good drug, right? Because it's, it's too dangerous. Um, so that is all taken into account. We'll actually get into that a little bit later in this talk here. So that's a good, uh, good segue for just a little bit later. So we talked about affinity how tightly the drugs will be binding to the receptor, but we also think about intrinsic activity too. So once that drug is bound to that receptor, what does it do, right? Does it activate it? Does it block it? Remember we talked about agonist and antagonist uh, uh, last time. And we also talked about partial agonist, right? So you can see that um, some drugs may have 100% intrinsic activity in activating that receptor. They could have a percentage of that, like with a partial agonist, or they could have no effect whatsoever, no intrinsic activity in the case of like a competitive antagonist, right? So competitive antagonists can have affinity for the receptor, but they have no intrinsic activity. It's kind of the hallmark of those antagonists there. So um, switching gears a little bit, going from those graded dose response curves, we also talk about the quantal dose response relationship. And so this is basically if you were looking at a population of people and what percentage of them are getting the uh, effect that you're looking for, right? Um, so imagine you had like 100 people enrolled in the study and you wanted to give them a drug. And now that effect can be anything, right? It could be um, percentage of people who have achieved the target blood pressure. It could be a certain reduction in pain scale. It could be sleep, and sleep is actually the example we're gonna be using here uh, in just a second, but it's an all or none phenomenon. It's kind of a binary sort of thing that you're deciding when you design that study. And so we're gonna see that it is plotted on the same curve, um, same looking curve as you're gonna see with our graded dose response here. And the only difference though is that our ED50 is gonna be when 50% of the subjects have achieved that desired effect, right? And then the top of the curve, the Emax, is gonna be when 100% of subjects have gotten that. So, you know, imagine you're uh, going to go back for surgery. You need to have like your gallbladder or something taken out. Um, you know, basically how much of that drug are you going to be uh, needing to receive in order to achieve sedation or to, in order to achieve sleep here? Um, in this case here, it's binary because you're either asleep or you're awake, right? Typically people, when they go back for surgery, they don't want to be awake. And so if we were to do a study, say on an inhaled anesthetic, for instance, um, we would see that the ED50 in this type of study would be when 50% of patients are asleep. Okay, it means 50% are awake, 50% are asleep. Now, does that mean we dose at that ED50? Well, no, that's ridiculous because if we dose it at the ED50, it's only 50-50 shot, the patient's asleep. And if they're awake and they're talking to you when they go to surgery, that's typically not a great thing because they, they will not give you very good reviews uh, afterwards, right? So um, again, that median effective dose when 50% of people manifest a given effect. But what's really handy here is not only can we look at the effect we're looking at, like the therapeutic effect, we can now start to look at things like uh, toxic effects, right? We can start to look at things like toxicities and we can say, okay, well, what, at what point did 50% of patients manifest a given toxic effect, right? Maybe uh, it's low blood pressure, right? Maybe it's vomiting. It could be anything really, but again, still an all or none sort of response there um, versus uh, then we have what we call the LD50. I'm sure most people have heard that term before. And that's the point at which 50% of your patients are dead, right? Now, again, you probably don't want to dose anywhere close to the LD50 because you are likely to not want to kill your patients, right? unless they're like really mean to you or something. Um, but for the most part, um, you want to stay far away from the LD50. And so we can actually start to compare these three different things and have an idea for how safe a drug is, right? You could have the, the, you could have the most effective drug in the entire world, but if it kills 10% of your patients, it's not a very good drug, right? 
So looking at this, we can see um, a comparison for a given drug, looking at the ED50, TD50, and LD50, right? So the ED50 should be the furthest over here to the left, right? Because that's the effective, uh, or the uh, therapeutic effect you're looking for. You can have your toxic effect here, which should be further over to the right. And then hopefully way over here to the right is going to be your lethal effect, right? Hopefully you're not getting anywhere close to this. But what's interesting is, depending on the toxic effect you're looking at, you may find that there's some overlap between the therapeutic and the toxic effect, right? Because no drug is completely safe. Uh, every drug has its own risk associated with it. So because of that, you can find some issues in terms of how much overlap there actually is here. And that's where we really get into the crux of drug safety and how um, not only efficacious it is, but how safe it might be for your given patient. So, and again, what we call that, that relationship between the toxic or the lethal effects and the therapeutic effect is what we call our therapeutic index. And this is essentially a ratio between the toxic or lethal effect to the, uh, the actual effective dose, right? Or the, uh, the ED50 here. And again, you can define this as anything, right? So LD50 is pretty straightforward because that's lethality, so it's either dead or alive. Um, but in terms of toxic effect, this could be a lot of different things. You could say this is vomiting, you could say it's um, a rash, you could say it's, um, you know, to deep a sedation, whatever the case may be, you define that, right? And so by looking at that therapeutic index and determining how much overlap there is or is not between this, that gives us an idea of how safe the drug is. Because you can have a drug where you may be dosing at this point here in order to get the majority of people getting the effect you're looking for, but then you're also going to see that you have a decent number of people who may be manifesting that toxic effect. Ideally, you'd want no overlap here, right? That's the safest kind of drug. But, I, uh, you know, and unfortunately in the real world, that often does not happen. And so another term you can use for this would be that margin of safety. So essentially how much distance do you have between the ED50 and the TD50 or LD50 if that's what you're looking at. Um, so again, looking at the dose response curve for morphine, looking at this, and then you see the depressive effect on respiration, right? That's one of the big dangers with opioids is that you can have respiratory depression, you stop breathing. So again, I could dose at the ED50 and get no toxicity very likely, but also only 50% of my patients are really gonna get the pain relief that they want. So that's not a very good idea. So you typically are gonna be dosing here towards the 90 to 100% sort of effect here, but that's when you're gonna to start to get some overlap here with the respiratory depressant effects. So if you're dosing it normally, and you're at normal therapeutic doses, you really shouldn't see a whole lot of respiratory depression, right? It should be relatively low risk. But you know what would happen if a patient took two doses on accident or they overdose and they're over here on the curve. Now you can start to see where it's becomes much more dangerous. And so if they had a bigger margin of safety here, then there's less likely to have that overlap and less likely to run into issues like respiratory depression. So, um, and so we call that, you know, the therapeutic index. It's just that ratio between one to the other, right? So there should be hopefully a positive number. And again, the bigger the number is, the safer the drug is, right? Because there's less overlap between those two curves there. So this is a common thing we do. And so we'll talk about things that have a wide therapeutic index to where there's very little overlap. And then we'll talk about things that have a narrow therapeutic index, which there is a lot of overlap. And so you're thinking, well, why would I ever use a narrow therapeutic index drug? Well, sometimes you have to. Sometimes that's the only thing you have available to treat a given condition for a patient. And so there's some ways we can get around that and actually have a whole lecture later on on things like therapeutic drug monitoring, where we actually can use the drug levels in the blood, correlate that to both therapeutic effects and toxic effects, and then see, make sure that patient is sort of right in the right range there, right? So anyway, so a high ratio here is going to be much more uh, preferable to a low ratio when you're looking at the therapeutic index. So um, as I mentioned, high TI is preferable to a low one. Uh, let's see, would accurate be an example? I'm not sure what you mean by accurate. I wonder if that's a typo. I mean, uh, let me know if that's a typo. But um, so imagine we have two different drugs here. We have diazepam and then we have digoxin. I'm actually wondering, do you mean Accutane? There you go, yes, Accutane. Um, yeah, Accutane's a good example. So Accutane, for those of you who don't know, it's a drug called isotretinoin. Um, it is used for more treatment-resistant acne. Um, and so that one is actually a narrow, I would consider it an narrow therapeutic index, mainly because we know there are so many side effects associated with it, even though it's really efficacious for treating that acne. Um, there's so much photosensitivity and rash, and um, you can even see things like worsen depression. So imagine, let's, let's use that as an example here. I'll draw that out real quick. 
And again, I apologize. I have very poor handwriting, as it turns out. Um, I'm left-handed, and so I'm using a right-handed on my mouse. So don't judge me too harshly. So let's imagine you're dealing with the drug Accutane. You have the dose here, and then we have our response here on the y-axis. And imagine you were looking at the therapeutic effect. Uh, you wanted to see therapeutic effect in terms of let's look at um, you know the effect on acne, right? So you might see this kind of curve here in terms of the effects on clearing up the skin, right? Versus if we were to say, look at something like, let's do orange, uh, say photosensitivity. You may find the curve is like over here. And so you can find that there's a fair bit of overlap. You know, most patients are gonna develop some degree of photosensitivity. That's why we always tell them, make sure you wear lots of sunscreen, make sure you stay out of the sun, you know, things like that. Um, but then you have other things that could be even worse, right? So there's risk for um, depression, suicidal ideation is something we worry about in some cases. And hopefully that one's gonna be even further here over to the right. We're gonna find that there really shouldn't be a whole lot of overlap between the therapeutic effect and those really nasty side effects of things like suicidality, right? However, you might find some patients are more sensitive to that. And so those curves can change even depending on the patient. But on average, on the whole, there really shouldn't be a whole lot of overlap between those really nasty side effects and the more therapeutic ones. But yes, Accutane, I'd probably consider to be a narrow therapeutic index drug, even though we don't do um, drug monitoring like levels on that one, but we just know it's kind of a nasty drug in terms of its uh, side effect profiles. Thank you for bringing that up. That's a great example. Um, but another example, too, looking at this would be um, two drugs. So we have diazepam, uh, otherwise known as Valium. That is a drug used to uh, treat anxiety or um, you can use it for muscle spasms, things like that. Pretty common drug. Um, it's relatively safe. You know, so say we have a therapeutic uh, index of 100. That's fairly high. And so that means that you can give a wide range of doses to get the uh, the effects you're looking for, the actual therapeutic effects. Uh, but it's hard to overdose that patient to where they'd actually die, right? So if you're looking at the LD50 to ED50, it's relatively high. It's hard to kill someone with just straight diazepam. Now, that's a whole other story once you start mixing and matching drugs. So I won't get into that uh, necessary, but somewhat forgiving, right? Versus the drug, like an antiarrhythmic called digoxin, this is frequently used for things like CHF and, and AFib. Um, you can find that it's maybe only two or three, right? So not really all that forgiving. Even small changes in dose can lead to some significant overlap of those toxic or even potentially lethal effects. So things to consider when you're looking at different drugs. And as you work, uh, depending on where you work, um, you'll get a feel for these different drugs in terms of what their relative therapeutic index is, right? So you won't initially, but when you're out there working, you'll know, okay, I know this drug is really dangerous. This drug is not quite as dangerous. So you kind of have an inherent knowledge of that therapeutic index. So I mentioned there's the narrow therapeutic index where typically you know, drugs have less than a two-fold difference between the median toxic or lethal doses and the median effective dose there, right? And so generally, you're going to find that uh, with those narrow therapeutic index drugs, we'll have a lot of monitoring associated with it. Um, we'll do things like either monitor blood levels or you might actually monitor <clears throat> other uh, uh, clinical indicators. So if you've ever heard of the drug uh, warfarin or Coumadin, that's a blood thinner, it's an anticoagulant. That one we don't measure Coumadin levels, but we actually can measure things like PTINR, which is a uh, means of telling how thin the blood is, how long it takes for it to clot. And so we can use that as a surrogate indicator to tell us how much effect we're getting from a given dose of warfarin for a patient. So all of that we call uh, therapeutic drug monitoring. And so actually, uh, with my first rotation when I was in pharmacy school, um, we did a, a Coumadin clinic, right? That's basically what I did for two months straight, was uh, having patients come in. We did a point of care finger stick test for, for INR, and we would adjust their dose based off the responses they had there. So again, that's all I did for two months. And you'll find that depending on the drug, that there can be a pretty big industry for that or big need for, I suppose. So just to give you some examples of uh, drugs with a narrow therapeutic index, here are several that we would do therapeutic drug monitoring on. Um, so you can see, and it don't, you, know, you don't have to know all these drugs, uh, don't memorize the slide by any means, but just to give you some examples of what we're looking at in terms of blood levels and just how narrow some of these things can be here. So for instance, with lithium carbonate, lithium we use a lot for bipolar uh, disorder, you know, 0.6 to 1.2 milliequivalents per liter. I mean, it's, it's minuscule changes in dose um, can lead to really big changes in that blood level. And that's that we use that as a surrogate for the actual clinical effect we might see or the toxic effects there. Uh, that drug digoxin I mentioned, 0.8 to 2 nanograms per ml. That's an extremely potent drug we're giving on the order of micrograms. And you're looking at nanogram levels in the blood, right? It just shows you how potent some of these drugs can be uh, when they're in, in the body, right? 
So just give you those examples there. Um, again, looking at two uh, examples too, if you were to compare two different drugs, uh, warfarin, as I mentioned, mean that blood thinner has a relatively small therapeutic index because again, it's an extension of its clinical effect. It thins the blood so you don't clot and cause a stroke, but also we know that by thinning the blood, you increase the risk for bleeding. That's just an inherent thing within uh, the nature of that drug. So it's gonna have a relatively small therapeutic index, right? On the other hand, we imagine something like the antibiotic penicillin has a pretty large therapeutic index too, right? Because um, you know it is relatively specific for treating bacteria. It doesn't really look at our cells as potential targets. You can have a really wide therapeutic window here. You can have someone that could take a tenfold overdose of penicillin, and yeah, they might have some diarrhea, some vomiting, but they're not going to have any, um, you know, risk of death from that, and, and you know, unless they were deathly allergic to it or something like that. But uh, for the most part, using things with a wide therapeutic window is really helpful, right? So I'll give you a good example too. Um, so the treatment for depression can be really tough, um, especially because one of the big risks you'll see, especially with adolescents and, and children, is that when you start someone on an antidepressant, there actually is an increased risk for suicidality. You are know, like, man, like, why are we giving people antidepressants that doesn't cause them to kill themselves? It's relatively rare, um, but it's a known side effect. And you're going to educate every patient you start on antidepressant on that effect. Well, back in, like, say, for instance, like the 80s, maybe early 90s, uh, all we had were these drugs called tricyclic antidepressants or TCAs, uh, things like amitriptyline, uh, Elevil, things like that. Um, and they were extremely toxic. If you took even a two- or three-fold overdose of that drug, you could potentially die from that, right? It was a very, very toxic drug, but it's kind of like the best thing we had at the time to treat depression, so we kind of had to deal with it. Nowadays, though, we have things like the SSRIs. We have things like Prozac and, and Celexa and Lexapro and all those things. Um, you can take handfuls of that stuff and not really be any major risk for dying. So because drugs have become safer, we have wider therapeutic indexes, that means that it is uh, more appropriate to use those treatments if it's right for your patient, right? Because overall, you want to shoot for safety and efficacy at the same time. So uh, again, summary of the curves here. Again, they can be graphed either linearly or semi-logarithmic. You'll see mostly semi-logarithmic on uh, most of the curves I'll be showing you. And again, they're helping to provide some of that critical information in terms of making rational therapeutic decisions, right? So again, you don't always have to give the most efficacious drug. So going back to, um, for instance, the Accutane example, I don't have to start a patient on Accutane for, for acne, right? There's lots of other options that may be ultimately less effective, but may be effective enough for my particular patient. Maybe I'll start them on some doxycycline or I'll start them on, heck, you know, do some benzoyl peroxide uh, scrubs or something like that. You know, That may be effective enough for that particular patient. So um, all of that is gonna go into our decision-making and deciding what's the best option for our particular patient, okay? So uh, the next thing I wanna talk about here is going to be, um, like, why do people have variations in drug response in this? Like, why um, can you give two people who are similar um, the same dose of a drug, but they have wildly different responses, right? Um, there's several things that go into that, and I'll talk about that um, as we kind of go forward with this particular section here. Um, and you may even find that at different courses of treatment, like different time points, patients may have different responses to that, right? And so you want to be cognizant of that. You want to be thinking about these things in order to try to predict where you can, why patients might have these variations in response in this, right? So a couple ones we'll talk about here include uh, things called idiosyncratic responses. We'll talk about tolerance and another term called tachyphylaxis and then hyper and hypo reactive responses. So why are patients having these variations? These are some of the reasons why. So idiosyncratic ones are the easiest ones to talk about first because they're just rare, they're abnormal. We don't really know why patients have these particular reactions, right? And it's also really hard to predict because we don't know who's gonna have them, right? And, and it's not really explained by the pharmacologic action of the drug. It's like warfarin is a blood thinner, so I know bleeding is a risk, right? That makes sense because that's the mechanism of the drug. Um, but these are things, not allergic responses, uh, and they can't really re be reproduced with regularity in other patients, right? So you can't give it to a, a patient, see this weird oddball effect, and expect every patient to have that. It's just a rare kind of uh, unpredictable thing. And some of it may or may not be dose dependent. A lot of times it's not. Uh, frequently it's because of a genetic predisposition someone might have to a given reaction, right? Their patient may have a genetic um, abnormality or change. It could be their normal genetics, but um, that can predispose them to one of these reactions. And unless you test for that, 
which oftentimes we don't because it affects such a small number of people, um, you'll, you may never know until that patient manifests that reaction. So here's an example, uh, a drug called Primaquin, which is a, a malaria drug, can lead to things like hemolysis and hemolytic anemia in patients if they have what we call a G6PD deficiency, this glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase. Basically, um, these drugs can act as strong oxidizers leading to hemolysis and, and releasing of these blood cells. So, you know, we know people out there have G6PD deficiencies, but it's not so prevalent that we should test every patient for it. And so you have, you can, some of you may even have a G6PD deficiency and not even know about it unless you were challenged with one of these drugs. But once you know about it, then you gotta be really careful because this is a potentially fatal reaction here. And so it's hard to be able to diagnose that. Um, you know, there are some drugs that where um, we have to test, you know, for a genetic predisposition to certain things because you know the risk is there. Um, there's one drug um, who uh, is, is used for HIV. It's called Abacavir. Abacavir is a good drug, but if you have a specific polymorphism and you express this one particular polymorphism, you have a really high risk for having um, anaphylaxis. And so we have to make sure if we're going to use that for patients, so we test them for that polymorphism because we know that risk is there. But a long time that we didn't know about that or we couldn't test for it, it was one of these idiosyncratic responses, right? So um, ideally what you can do is use different drugs if that's possible, but it may not always be the case. We don't have that, uh, that option there. I was going to see. Uh, Kelly says, Dr. Butler discussed that in Clin Lab, saying overseas they would test soldiers for G6PD deficiency. Yeah, too, that's a good point. Um, so think about your audience, right? So think about um, if they're overseas where they're going to require things like malaria prophylaxis, then because you have such a large set of patients that are going to be um, tested for that or being getting treated for that, then maybe it makes sense to do that, right? Maybe that makes good cost-effective sense. Versus over here, malaria cases are relatively low to non-existent and so it doesn't really make sense to do that uh, to do that check so that's a very good point um, think about your audience and think about where you're working at in the world and it may be more or less um, relevant to actually do that it's a great point so getting into um, hypo and then hyper reactive responses so this is where you say you give like a given dose of a drug to a patient and you either get like a really diminished response or you see like a really increased response um, over what you would normally expect to see um, so a good example of this is diphenhydramine or Benadryl. Most people, most of you have probably taken Benadryl at some point in your life. You know, we use it a lot for allergies and things like that. Well, for some patients, um, you can give a relatively small dose of Benadryl and they're just zonked out for like two days practically, right? They get really bad um, hangover from it. They're, you know, really groggy in the morning. Um, they just happen to be more sensitive to that. In some cases you may find, especially we see this more often with like little kids, especially they can have what we call a paradoxical reaction. And this is where you give a dose of Benadryl to a kid and they basically go bananas. They go, they go, they get very excited. They get anxious. They are bouncing off the walls they're screaming. Um, and so that's something you don't normally expect to see. We get this really kind of hyper reactive response to that. You can see this too um, with different types of pain medications, potentially um, those patients with the CYP2D6 polymorphism um, having excessive sleepiness. And I mentioned this, I think last time, where we talked about kids getting um, codeine and being able to convert a ton of it over into morphine in, uh, due to this polymorphism. And it's actually led to some in death in some cases there. Allison said, I've heard of parents giving kids Benadryl for a flight, hoping they'd be sleepy, and then, nope. Yeah, I was really scared the first time we gave our kids uh, Benadryl both times uh, because I was worried, like, I've seen it happen in the ER, and I was like, oh, no, I know what can happen here. I know if we give them a dose uh, and, and, you know, they have this hyperactive response, we're going to be in trouble all night. But fortunately, they responded normally to it. So, again, these are going to be people on uh, sort of the outskirts of the curve, right? So most people tend to react to a drug the same way. It's like, it's like a bell-shaped curve, um, but you have those outliers there that you have to think about. So um, we have what we call tolerance. And so this is basically where, say you're on a drug for a continued period of time. Um, this is where you, over time, get a diminished response to that dose of a drug, right? So say um, you were taking a blood pressure medication, you get a good 20 point drop in your systolic blood pressure. And then over time, maybe it goes down to like 15 and then 10 and then five, and then maybe, you know, maybe stick around that five level, five point drop. Um, to overcome this, this is where we have to um, basically change the dose, right? So in some cases, this tolerance can be overcome by giving a bigger dose. And so you'll see this too a lot with like opioids 
and then benzodiazepines, which are anxiolytics, you know, uh, muscle relaxers, things like that. But, um, you know, I've had cases where um, you imagine patients who are on chronic opioids, they work themselves up to some really big doses. So for instance, if you have, um, say, uh, you know, an elderly patient, they have terminal cancer, uh, and they've been on you know, opioids for years and years, they've worked themselves up to a really hefty dose. And I've seen cases where family members or kids or someone goes and takes, you know, their 90 year old grandma's morphine, not realizing that she's worked up to the dose that can kill an elephant. They take it one time dose and they're basically out for the count, right? So again, these are things that happen to where you have to be able to overcome this tolerance by kind of gradually increasing the dose. Eventually, can they reach a plateau and need a different med? Sometimes um, with this, with this particular phenomenon, we're talking about things that can be overcome with changes in dose. So um, we'll talk about that a little, a little bit in just a few minutes. So I'll, I'll get back to that point there. Um, but I'm sure most of you probably experience, um, you may be experiencing this now, this plateau effect you can get with, with caffeine, right? So, um, you know, the normal dose of caffeine for you, say before you started PA school, you get a nice little, little boost out of it, feeling good for the morning. But then it's like, now you got to study for like, 20 hours a day and so now you're just like consuming a ton of it you're going to notice that after a while like you don't get the same boost from it now you're just like kind of maintaining normal levels of functioning by having to consume vast amounts of caffeine right so it's a, it's a common thing i've seen this in every every class i did the same thing i still kind of do the same thing um so you know no, no no judgment there but it's a normal effect you expect to see from these drugs there's a different phenomenon though called tachyphylaxis and so um this is something to where um you can't overcome the loss of effect or the plateau effect by altering the dose. And so this can happen sometimes even with the first dose. Um, and you're gonna find that even if you keep increasing the dose, you're not gonna get any increase in response, right? Oh yeah, and the caffeine withdrawal is awful. The, the rebound headaches are just, just the worst. Um, and so sometimes this, this effect, this tachyphylaxis can occur by depletion of endogenous uh, uh, you know, cofactors. It can be reduced uh, reduction in neurotransmitters. It could be a lot of different things causing this loss of drug effect. And so you can see this frequently with things like amphetamines. Um, so if you imagine patients who are either taking illicit amphetamines like, um, you know, meth. Uh, you know, methamphetamine, you can see there's a lot of patients taking drugs for ADHD, so like, you know, dexmethylphenidate and things like that. Um, what happens with amphetamines, they actually increase alertness by causing release of catecholamines from those synaptic terminals, right? And so if you run out of catecholamines, it doesn't matter how many more amphetamines I give, just nothing's going to happen, right? And so that's a reason why you get that plateau effect that cannot be overcome by giving more drug. Or nicotine is another thing, you can see a similar effect there. One really good clinical example, though, is nitroglycerin for chest pain. We already talked about that a little bit ago. So um, what happens with um, nitroglycerin is if you ever look at dosing for it, um, you know, you have the typical like sublingual and use at the onset of, you know, anginal pain, right? So you have chest pain, you want to take it under the tongue. If it doesn't go away, call 911, all that good stuff. Well, some patients um, with chronic angina, what you'll find is that they will be on a long-acting nitroglycerin form. So it could be a patch, it could be um, a type of uh, an oral dosage form, it could be a, uh, an ointment they put on. And if you ever look at the dosing there, you'll see they say, well, do 12 hour on, 12 hour off dosing. And you're like, well, why don't they use it 24 hours a day, right? Because angina can show up anytime. Well. You want to do that because if you use it 24 hours a day, you're going to find you get this diminished effect. So that way, when you do have an onset of anginal symptoms, you can take a whole bunch of nitroglycerin, nothing's going to happen. You're not going to have any decrease in that chest pain because uh, basically you run out of these cofactors and these different uh, pathways that occur that diminish the drug's effect. So what do you do? Well, you take away the drug for a while. You kind of let the body get back down to baseline, and then you can go back to that normal dose. And so that's why we do for long-acting nitroglycerin products, we do 12 hours on, 12 hours off. And that gives the body time to sort of get back down to baseline. And again, when do you get anginal symptoms? Well, when you're being up and active and, and walking around doing uh, physical exertion. So that 12 hours should probably be when the patient's awake and doing things versus when they're asleep for eight hours at night, uh, hopefully eight hours. Um, they shouldn't really have too many anginal symptoms, right? And so that's when they can use that, that off period to sort of reset the body for the next day. And so um, sort of the, the reasons why you get this uh, alteration in response is variation um, could be due to several different things. So for instance, it could be an alteration due to drug concentration that reaches the receptor. So if you start to maybe metabolize more of the drug, less of it gets to the receptor, that would cause a reduction effect. 
Um, it could have to do with things like variations in endogenous ligand concentration. So especially if you have, um, you know, drugs are competing for the same sites as an endogenous ligand, that could be an issue. Uh, could be changes in the number and function of receptors. We talked a little bit about up and down regulation before, and then sometimes it's actually downstream of that. So maybe with the secondary messenger systems or even further down the effector pathway where you can see those changes occur. So I'll talk about a few examples of that. So when you're talking about what's actually reaching the receptor there, that's when we're getting into some of the pharmacokinetic factors, right? So this is where we're talking about the absorption, distribution, metabolism, and excretion of the drug. And we'll actually get to this in the next lecture. Um, oftentimes what can happen, uh, for instance, you can have upregulation of hepatic enzymes, right? So if I have more enzymes in the liver to metabolize the drug, well, that's going to metabolize it that much faster. So a good example of this um, is a drug that is an anti-epileptic, but we also use it for bipolar disorders called carbamazepine. And so carbamazepine can actually have what they call auto-induction of its own metabolism. And that means is that basically you're going to find that you will have, um, as you start to take the drug at a normal dose, you'll start to see this upregulation of more and more um, of the enzymes being produced. So that means that even though you may get an initial effect out of the drug, this starts to diminish over the course of several days. And so to overcome that, you have to bump up the dose over the course of several weeks in order to get to kind of equilibrium to where hepatic enzymes are not going to keep upregulating and the dose is getting to the right concentration at the actual receptors, right? And lots of things can factor in that too, right? So you can look at things like gender and weight and age and all these different things um, may have an effect in terms of um, what sort of uh, drug concentration is actually getting to the receptor itself. Um, so for instance, you can have things like MDR genes or these multi-drug resistant uh, proteins uh, that are involved in transporting drugs can have an effect there. Um, you can find that if you're upregulating these proteins, um, that can affect um, how well like, cancer drugs work because if your cancer cells are spitting out the drug there, that can be an issue. So lots, lots of things can, can happen here. So um, let's look at an example of an endogenous ligand concentration. I'm sorry if there's any delay in the stream there. It looked like it kind of hitched up there for a little bit. Hopefully it'll stay uh, stay up. Um, anyway, if there is an issue with endogenous ligand concentration, so here's a good example of um, a drug called propranolol, or uh, Indrol is a brand name. It's used as a beta blocker, right? Blocks beta receptors, specifically um, on the heart, right? So beta-1 receptors. And so typically what you're going to find is that if you're in a state where you have high levels of catecholamines like epinephrine floating around, it will help slow down the heart rate because it basically competes for the same sites as those uh, uh, as epinephrine for the beta-1 receptors. And so it will then slow down heart rate. That's what we call a beta blocker, lowers heart rate. Well, you know, if you imagine if you're in a normal resting state and you're not really having high levels of catecholamines floating around, then the beta blocker shouldn't really do a whole lot, right? So you shouldn't really see much change in blood in your heart rate if your heart rate's not up to begin with. So imagine for stage fright, um, we'll do this to help with like performance anxiety um, because uh, you'll typically give it like right before a performance because that's when you're going to be in that more anxious state. That's when you're going to be in that state where you have a high amount of epinephrine increasing a heart rate. That's when the drugs will be most effective, right? So if you give it a baseline, nothing happens maybe. And then, uh, but it does work when you're in that high catecholamine state. Other things that can happen here um, can do with the number and function of the receptors we have available to us. And so you can find things where you may have increases in the number of receptors, you may have decreases, could be lots of different things going on there. And some of this could be related to things like hormones. Um, so for instance, like thyroid hormones, you know, we know that TSH, um, increasing release of T3 and T4 in the body can lead to increasing metabolism, but other things it can do, increasing the number of beta receptors in the heart, for instance. So and that makes the heart more sensitive to things like epinephrine and maybe making drugs more effective like beta blockers. So uh, that's why you typically see patients who are hyperthyroid, they will have tachycardia, palpitations, all of that as a result of this kind of increase in sensitivity. I note here too that by um, giving drugs, tachyphylaxis and tolerance can also lead to reduction in the number of functioning receptors, right? So fewer receptors are being sent out to the cell surface, so that way they can also modify the sensitivity. Because again, remember, the body always wants to maintain homeostasis, so it's going to resist the changes that are being induced by these medications here. So there's a process called desensitization that kind of goes along with tolerance and, and to some degree tachyphylaxis. Um, but this is where by giving repeated or continuous administration of an agonist, right, or maybe even an antagonist as the case may be, can change the responsiveness of the receptor. So instead of changing necessarily the number of receptors available at the cell's surface, what if we just made them less sensitive, right? 
And a lot of this is sort of um, protective measures that your body and your cells will take to avoid sort of excess stimulation in the cell, right? Because if you overstimulate the cells, sometimes that can lead to damage, okay? And so by desensitizing the receptors, they become less sensitive to the drug, and thus you're going to get a diminished response. So the receptors are there, they're just less responsive to a certain degree. And you can kind of see an example of this. Imagine if I were to give a repeated uh, drug administration like epinephrine, you can see here get a good response first. If I were to say give another dose of the drug relatively shortly afterwards, I'm going to get a desensitization effect, right? Because again, you can imagine giving too much epinephrine is not a good thing because you can cause arrhythmias, you can cause hypertension, all of that. So you see it's diminished response. The body's trying to protect itself from over activation and then you can find here that if you were to say wait a while give it you know say 20 minutes then you go back and get the normal response out of that so sometimes a period of time can uh you can allow that to elapse and then that will allow for the resensitization to occur okay um, other things we can talk about include things like the rebound phenomenon. So this is something uh, that can happen when you're on a drug for a long period of time and then it's taken away, okay? So this can happen with agonists, it can happen with antagonists. I like to use the example of a beta blocker here, right? So propranolol, as we mentioned, is good for slowing down the heart rate and lowering blood pressure because it's blocking those beta-1 receptors on the heart, right? And so what you end up finding is, uh, is it the same thing as used uh, for allergen desensitization? Um, sort of. You can kind of consider, um, I'm trying to think of a good way to talk about that because it doesn't have to do with like specific receptors there, uh, but you kind of see the same effect, right? So when you say allergen, allergen desensitization, you're giving very small doses of uh, uh, an allergen and gradually increasing that to where the body sort of desensitized to it. So this is kind of the same thing, but more at the receptor level. Uh, happening here but usually this is not a great thing because then our drug is not working as effectively so um you know in the case of allergen desensitization that's a good thing because you don't want your patients to have anaphylaxis to something um but in the case here for the drugs this is sort of like a normal phenomenon at, at the receptor level that is usually um not a great thing it's usually kind of uh, fighting us a little bit but, it, but it's expected in many cases there so anyway, so this rebound phenomenon. So imagine you had a patient who's on a beta blocker for a long period of time. Well, when you're blocking all of those receptors there, the body's response is saying, hey, well, there's not enough activation here. Let's try to upregulate the number of receptors that are available. So that way you're trying to increase uh, the sensitivity of the heart to the um, sort of the normal ligands like epinephrine and, and norepine and all of that. And so what actually happens though is that when you take away that drug all of a sudden, you can get this rebound effect or this really um, sort of uh, this really exaggerated effect you can see here and so I have a little animation here so imagine this is the myocardial tissue imagine this is a cell the lipid bilayer here are your beta 1 receptors and this is the normal ligand right this is normal epinephrine that would activate those let's imagine that normally you have a heart rate of 75 and your blood pressure is a little high at 145 over 90. Well, what happens if I put a beta blocker on board? Well, now that I'm antagonizing all these receptors here, you see the heart rate goes down and the blood pressure is down to, to normal levels. Well, over time, what you're going to find is by blocking up all these receptors here, the heart says, well, I'm not getting enough activation. Let me go and upregulate the number of receptors available. So you can see there's even more of them here. And then you have more propranol coming by on those up and so everything is still good. But what happens if I take away all this beta blocker all of a sudden? Well, now I have more receptors that are available to be activated. And so you can see this increased or exaggerated response where the heart rate and the blood pressure is actually higher than what it was at baseline. And this is really bad with some blood pressure medications because you can find patients may develop um, MI from this. There's been stroke that has happened because of this. And so this is why there's certain drugs. You want to tell patients like, hey, don't quit this cold turkey. You got to wean yourself off of it because you can see these really exaggerated responses potentially. Um, we'll see also in terms of genetic factors that can play a role in this. So for instance, um, you can find uh, that certain deletions um, or additions or even just single polymorphisms can cause um, varying effect to certain drugs. And so um, this is why you may find uh, that for certain drugs work better in certain populations, right? So you may find that, um, you know, for instance, black patients will uh, respond to a given drug better or worse than, say, white patients, right? Or maybe Asian patients. And so a lot of it all depends on their background polymorphisms and, and all of that 
and certain genetic traits uh, that can uh, be affecting this. So sometimes it can be on the individual patient level, or sometimes it can be relegated to you know a larger eth ethnic group potentially. And so we'll kind of look at some examples of that as we go forward. Like hypertension is a really good example of this, where you tend to find um, that like um, when you're choosing initial drugs for patients, you kind of look at you know, even the guidelines will say if you have a black patient, maybe start them out on this drug. If not, then you can start them out on this drug instead. And so it goes to show us, you know, kind of what kind of responses we can get based on just genetic factors too. So um, looking at kind of what happens downstream of the receptor. So what are some things that happen there? Um, we can find that, um, you know, the body resists change, right? Homeostasis is what it's generally trying to do. So for instance, imagine I'm giving a beta blocker like propranolol to lower that blood pressure, right? Well, typically beta blockers work mostly in the heart to lower that blood pressure, right? Because ultimately if you're decreasing contractility, you're decreasing that force of uh, output, that can help to lower blood pressure, right? Well, sometimes what you'll find is that even other tissues may be antagonizing that. So for instance, if the kidneys detect low pressure, and they're going to say, well, I need more blood volume here. Let's try, let's try to get the, the pressure up. They'll start to hold on to more water, hold on to more salt. And all of a sudden, you're kind of fighting yourself a little bit. So this is why sometimes you need patients on two or three different blood pressure medications in order to overcome some of those antagonistic effects that the body is doing to try to maintain a normal blood pressure. Because remember, for these patients who have disease, like you know, 120 over 80 may be what we call a normal blood pressure, but over time, Maybe 160 over 100 is normal for them. The body gradually changes to a new normal, and so it, it tries to resist those changes there. And that's, that can be overcome over time, um, but this is some of the things you'll see depending on the class of drugs we're using. So real briefly, I want to talk about on clinical selectivity, so sort of looking at beneficial versus toxic effects you can see with these drugs here. So when I say selectivity, I'm talking about how specific drugs are for a given tissue or for, say, a given type of receptor uh, that's there, right? And so frequently what you're going to find is that um, it can be dose-dependent. Um, you can certainly lose selectivity, especially at really high doses. And, and again, we want things that are generally more selective than non-selective, right? good example of this is chemotherapy drugs versus antibiotics, right? So antibiotics, they're looking for bacterial targets and not human targets, right? So that's why they pre preferentially affect bacterial cells and not our cells. That means they're generally less toxic. I talked about penicillin earlier. It has a pretty wide therapeutic index. On the other hand, when there are chemotherapeutics, they kind of can't tell the difference in a lot of cases, and this is especially for the old school ones, where they can't tell the difference between a cancerous cell and a healthy cell. They affect both of them equally, which means they're very toxic. That's why you see um, the alopecia. That's why you see um, you know, the GI cells being affected and all of that, because it can't really tell the difference and is not very selective. So generally, selective drugs can be a little bit better uh, than not. And so you can find um, by comparing the ED50s, and for the different effects of a given drug, you can start to isolate those out and kind of tell, um, you know, look at the relative comparison between uh, their effects there. And, and again, when I'm talking about like comparing ED50s for different effects of a drug, think back to that example of Benadryl. Some people take Benadryl to help them sleep, but for other people, that's a side effect or they're taking it for their allergies, right? So again, you can look at different ED50s depending on the clinical effect of the drug you're, you're looking at there. And so generally, we're trying to separate out the selectivity. We're looking at both the therapeutic effects and we also want to take into account the toxic and the side effects because depending on the example, one person's toxic effect could be another person's therapeutic effect, right? So um, sometimes you're going to find that the beneficial and the toxic effects are going through the same receptor, the same exact mechanism. And so this is typically where you're going to see that the mechanism of the drug, if taken to unsafe extremes can lead to those side effects and it's through the same mechanism. So I'd mentioned warfarin before, being a blood thinner, well, patient having too thin of blood can lead to toxicity, you can stroke out, you know, GI bleeds, things like that. Uh, similarly, insulin is normally used to lower blood sugar, but if I give someone too much insulin, then that's gonna lead to hypoglycemia. So you can see here, you're weighing sort of the beneficial effects versus the risk and adjusting the dose uh, accordingly, right? And that's why we do things like monitoring. So we can monitor your blood sugar, we can monitor your PTINR to make sure you're not gonna bleed out, okay? But it's all through the same mechanism. So we kind of know you have to take the good with the bad, sort of like a double-edged sword. Sometimes what you can find though is that certain drugs, um, if we can, we can try to just treat one area of the body. That would be ideal, right? So if I'm having a lung problem, well, let's just treat the lungs. Not always so easy though. So if imagine you have someone who's having an asthma exacerbation, 
typically a set of drugs we'll give are going to be our glucocorticoids or your steroids, right? So you get like a, a methylprednisolone dose pack, you get prednisone, whatever the drug case may be. Well, even though you're having a lung problem, if you're taking an oral tablet, those are going to be affecting all the tissues in the body. So you can end up finding that for patients with diabetes, their blood sugar is going to go up when they're on steroids. You're going to find if they have CHF, they're going to have more fluid retention. Those are all through the same mechanism, but it's just because of working on different tissues and what we really care about. So what are some ways we can get around that? Well, we can do things like lowering the dose and using just the most, uh, the lowest effective dose possible. Sometimes we can get around it by using different routes of the drug. So for instance, if I can use an inhaled steroid, that's preferentially just going to affect the lungs and spare the rest of the body. Or if I can get around these drugs with an alternative mechanism, that's not always possible, but it can be one way to try to get around that issue there, right? So, um, and again, too, when we're looking at um, drugs and we're discovering them for the first time, we realize that they can bind to many different types of receptors potentially. And in some cases, you can try to get more specific with your drugs, and that way they only affect one type of receptor. So for instance, like epinephrine, we know that it binds to alpha receptors and beta receptors and some other places as well. Um, so it's not all that selective. But sometimes you can make a drug really selective and only affect one specific subtype of a receptor. So for instance, if you ever heard of like an H1 blocker, or is an H2 blocker. H1 blockers are things like, and H being histamine here, H1 being uh, uh, mediation through uh, for allergies and things like that. So Benadryl is an H1 blocker versus H2 blockers are located mostly in the GI tract in the stomach. And they deal with heartburn, right? They can actually decrease acid production. So by having that selectivity there, you can actually isolate out certain effects that you're looking for. So that way, if I have a patient who um, has heartburn, they're producing too much stomach acid, I'm not going to give them something that blocks H1 and H2 because then all of a sudden they're going to be super sleepy, right? We don't necessarily want to do that. Uh, another example would be certain enzymes we can actually target for. So if you ever hear about like a COX-2 inhibitor, that's a specific type of NSAID that actually avoids some of the issues of other NSAIDs, including things like GI bleeds and whatnot. We'll get into more of the mechanisms of that later, so don't worry too much about these specific examples, but I just want to kind of illustrate the point uh, here. And so and it was kind of cool, too, is that even sometimes um, side effects of medications can actually lead to new therapeutic effects. So, for instance, the drug minoxidil or Rogaine, it was originally used to lower blood pressure because it actually is a really strong vasodilator. Um, they were trying it and they actually realized it's a pretty, pretty crummy um, vasodilator. It doesn't really work all that well for blood pressure. But they noticed that when they were giving it to patients, they found increased hair growth. I said, okay, well, it's not great as a blood pressure medication. Maybe try putting it on the scalp, and all of a sudden, now you got new hair growth. So sometimes you can find um, sort of via serendipity these kind of new uh, effects for a drug and use it for a different purpose. Um, another recent example I can think of is there's a set of drugs um, used for diabetes originally, um, and one of the major side effects of it was weight loss. Now, okay, well, what if I give it to patients who don't have diabetes? Guess what? You still get the same weight loss effects. Um, and so sometimes you'll find sort of um, different uses for a drug over what it was originally designed for in a lot of cases. And generally, when you're trying to um, select for a drug, you want to consider things like the side effects and the toxicity, not just how efficacious a drug is going to be. Or even like duration of effect can be important too. And so it's not just as easy as looking at potency and efficacy of the drug. You kind of have to look at all those other factors, right? So again, you have to take the good with the bad, the patient situation, cost, all these different things are going to go into how you select which drug is best for my patient. And we'll get, I mean, that's what we're going to talk about all next year. So don't worry too much about that now. We're going to get into all that as we go forward. So anyway, I know it was a lot of stuff. Do um, you guys have any questions I can answer regarding this topic? I'm going to go ahead and check the board here. But do you have a question here? It's fantastic. Okay. Uh, for the exam, are we expected to know the pathways for the secondary messengers you mentioned? Or would you want us to focus on the general idea of the roles? Um, I would have a general idea of the, the mechanisms there. So, like, for instance, you should know that, like, adenyl cyclase forms cyclic AMP. You know, um, do I need you to know the mechanism for how glycogenolysis is kicked off and gluconeogenesis in the hepatocyte. No, I'm not going to ask you that. Um, but I would expect you to know that like IP3 has a lot to do with calcium uh, regulation in, in secondary messenger pathways, right? Um, I would know like your different receptor types, you know, the ion gated versus, um, um, you know, nuclear receptors, uh, you know, things like that. Those are kind of things I would focus on for, for testing purposes. And again, for this one, you'll find for this class in particular, it's a lot more 
conceptual, um, you know, definitions, things like that. So the material is not quite as in depth as it's going to be when we get into form one and two later on. So some people kind of, um, you know, it's a little easier, I would say, this class, but don't let that lull you to a false sense of security. You'll find that form one and two will certainly pick up the pace a little bit as we get into that. So um, what other questions can I answer for you all? must have explained everything perfectly because I don't see much coming up here or anything to that matter. All right, and I think our next meeting time is actually going to be at our homepage here. So our next meeting is going to be Friday, uh, July 10th at 1230. So, um, oh, thank you so much. You don't, you don't have to say that. It doesn't, um, doesn't affect your grade at all, you know. Um, that's usually going to be more of a monetary thing, so think about that. And keep in mind, um, uh, I don't get any kind of monetary um, uh, benefit from my YouTube channel, um, but if you subscribe, it does make me feel a little bit better. It's a little bit of validation, so um, you know, always feel free to smash that subscribe button. That's totally, totally fine too. Thank goodness. Oh, I'll wait for that check to come in. All right, well, if nothing else, um, I'll probably hang out here for another minute or two, but you're free to go, um, and I will see you guys on Friday.